Hi, hello. Um, my name is Malcolm Smith. I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon, uh, initially trained in England. We've spent a considerable time in the US since then. Uh, I'm now a professor and uh, head of the trauma department at the University of Massachusetts in Worcester. Uh, I've been asked to talk to you about proximal femur fractures. Um, I appreciate I'm talking to a non-US mainly environment. And I hope what I, what I say here makes some sense. Given that this talk is really aimed at Gambia, um, I think we clearly have to be aware of what local culture and facilities are available. I'm going to go through what I think is the appropriate understanding of a femoral fracture, proximal femoral fracture, but also, and um, all this should be taken and understood within the context of your environment. Having said that, once you understand the mechanics and the nature of the fracture, then you can plan the appropriate treatment. My message here is first, do no harm. Know the local culture, know your patient, know your own hospital, know what you have available to work with, and be honest and know yourself. None of them may be the most appropriate care in that environment. We don't all have operating rooms that look like this. Uh, I actually don't anymore either. This is my previous operating room, my channel and floor line work there. So I'm going to review the anatomy, the mechanics, and fracture characteristics of proximal femoral fractures, talking about intracapsular proximal femur, extracapsular proximal femur, and getting to subtropical femur. I'm going to talk about the, the appropriate early orthopedic surgical management when you've got equipment available and the late management of late presenting cases, which I know are a big problem around the world, and then about non-union. And the essence of understanding these is understanding the physics and the anatomy and the mechanics of the local area of the field. So, fairly straightforward, off the web picture of a femur and a pelvis. The important thing to see here is the capsule, which I'm showing with the cursor, which attaches the base of the neck, corresponding to the blue line on the right side. So any fracture in the femoral head side of the blue line is intracapsular, and that includes femoral head. And a lot of femoral neck fractures, until you get to basal cervical, which is at the base of the capsule, and then extracapsular fractures, the trochanteric group and the subtrochanteric group. So intracapsular and extracapsular. The essence of the intracapsular fracture is, of course, that the femoral head is invaginated in the capsule and has essentially minimal blood supply inside the capsule. It comes through the neck or around the edge of the neck on the, on the, uh, the reflections of soft tissue. And if you break that, you make the head vascular. And um, that's critically important in some patients. So here we are intracapsular femoral neck fractures. The issue here is the anatomy. Um, clearly, because the vascularity is so important, the more displacement that occurs, and that's classified usually by garden as a traditional classification, um, the more displacement you have, the more disruption of femoral neck vascularity, and therefore the higher risk of the vascular necrosis. That's particularly important in young patients. That's particularly important in young patients um, because they usually have fairly good and femoral neck bone. Most of femoral neck fractures are in elderly, frail patients, including my population. And the issue there is much less of vascular necrosis because you don't have to live that long. The big issue is the mechanical quality of the bone, which leads to femoral neck shortening and collapse if you try and fix it and preserve the head. So for elderly patients, I'm much more worried about mechanical shortening and collapse than I am about AVN, although AVN is clearly important too. So for undisplaced femoral neck fractures, that's garden grade one and two, because of the lack of displacement, AVN is unlikely, we'd nearly always just fix that. In the very elderly, because of the risk of bone collapse and poor mechanics and the poor bone quality, we just replace that with a hemiarthroplasty. With displaced fractures, that's garden grade three and four, AVN is likely, we fix it in the young, then reduce it and fix it in the young, and we replace it in the elderly. 
Here we have some examples of the same thing. And on the far left here, we have slightly valgus impacted, which is a good position for stability. I'm not looking for perfect anatomy. I'm looking for slight valgus impaction because it makes the head more stable on the neck. And held in this case with three screws. For this situation, I prefer three screws. So I can put them in how I want to, and I can use the screws to aid and support my reduction by pulling in certain directions. These tend to clap backwards and the valgus. So I pull with the anterior superior screw first, put it into the position I want here. In the, so in the various place, place fractures, in the young patient, we get this reduction in fixation. It was close in an anatomic position, you can do. Slight valgus is great. In the elderly, we get replaced. This is a typical cemented hemiarthroplasty. In my culture, there's an, an issue with the more active elderly. Uh, and currently, there's a big fashion to move towards putting total hip replacement into the active older person with terminal neck fractures. No, that's not fully supported by the literature. Um, so, total hip replacement, one thing I want to say is the bones getting frail, you don't use uncemented total hip, it's back to be banging in hard with mallet. You use cemented in to avoid additional damage to the femur and avoid proximal femoral polyposetic fractures during the surgery. Right, let's move to extra capsule fractures. It's outside the capsule, there's minimal or no risk of the end of the you see it, and the real problem is mechanical instability. Because of that sort of fractures, there's a range of different levels of stability. Sorry, using my voice, I have a quick break. Copy. So now I'm going to talk about the mechanics of the proximal femur. There's a typical fracture. If you think about the proximal femur, that what causes the problem in mechanics is the offset of the femoral neck from the femoral shaft. Axial pressure from the body, weight bearing, is in the middle of the femoral head. Resultant force from the ground that holds us up is up the line of the femoral shaft. There's an offset by the length of that femoral neck. That offset creates a turning moment which makes the fracture or any typical deformity collapse into varus. So the whole thing shortens and collapses into varus, usually with a bit of external rotation because of the pull of the local muscles as well. And if you disconnect source, it becomes an external rotator. So shortening and collapse of the varus with external rotation, very typical for terminal neck fractures, all because of the offset and the turning moment. If you look at a picture of the trabeculae inside the femoral neck, you'll see the principal trabeculae are specifically designed in the normal person to, to provide tension and compression support to offset this weight here, which creates a turning moment. So these are tension trabeculae at the top, and compression spectral at the bottom, making it cantilever. The sort of fracture that you have creates a different range of stability. And a very minimally common fracture, less fragments, more intrinsic bone stability, and more common issue. Again, the result is collapse into varus. The comminution makes a big difference, specifically about which bits of bone are lost, and they're called buttresses. We have the medial buttress, usually represented by the lesser appendage, and the lateral buttress, represented by the lateral bone margin of the femur. Classification details this comminution and helps us to decide what implants to use during fracture control. So any trochanteric fracture must be reduced and reduced in all planes so that it doesn't turn backwards, right? And um, once it's reduced, which I'm going to assume, you need a strong device to counteract the local forces. Quite commonly, that's been for years been a sliding hip screw. You cannot use isolated screws to support this sort of fracture. You can't use those three screws I showed previously to support this. There's no cantilever support in the back of the femur. They're only useful for fractures up here in the femoral neck and not appropriate for extra capsules. So the implant must provide cantilever support. That means the strength of the outside angle here supports the pressure over here. So the cantilever is a lateral device that supports, support, supports force at the tip. Because of the nature of the bone as well, this bone tends to collapse a little bit as it heals. 
So a sliding hip screw slides at this margin here to allow this bone here to collapse a little, which helps help to free up and actually shortens the moment arm during the healing process and takes away the various stress. A nail does the same thing, again, it slides, but it's for its, its control forces in the center of the femur, not at the edge. So the offset is less for a nail. And it can, it's essentially a stronger device. Here we have a pretty high energy displaced intratocan fracture of the femur, clearly well displaced. Once it's reduced and put together, and it, it'll, be, it'll be pretty easy to hold together. On this AP x ray, we're seeing an AP of the neck and probably a lateral of the femur, because this is the greater trochanter seen with the it facing away from us and the fracture facing towards us because of the external rotation of the thigh. Here it is reduced. It's been fixed with its sliding hip screw. And one additional screw, which helps counteract the tendency of this screw, big screw, to rotate this fragment. And um, this stops rotating and gives you more control. As it is, the reduction is very good. Screws a bit long, could be better than that. But it's now healed in this position. Classification of the fractures tells us how to choose the implants required to control the implants. This is the AO, AO or OTA classification of the fracture. It's bone three, zone one, and the A type fractures are extra articular, close to the joint fractures, classified into one, two, and three by degrees of combination and position of the fracture line. Relatively simple, extra captures are A1. Comminution gets you into A2, getting worse through the spectrum, and A3 are the subtropic joint fractures. Have the reverse oblique, reverse compared to that line, that's the reverse oblique, transverse or common. And here, please, we need to call it. You have to think of the medial and lateral buttresses. This is the medial buttress, which is represented by the lesser trochanter. In, in this fracture here, the medial buttress is common. The lateral buttress is the other side of the femur. Here it's getting very small, and in these fractures, it's, it's breaking below it, the lateral buttress is non existent. So we know from lots of studies that a hip screw works very well for an A1 fracture. Even with medial buttress problems, the hip screw is designed to deal with that because it allows slide as long as you've got the reduction right. So the hip screw works very well for A1 fractures. You have to reduce it properly, it will slide, and you should be aware of the tip apex distance. That's the distance between the tip of here and the middle of the bone on the AP and lateral. It's got to be less than two and a half centimeters, otherwise, that is too far from the, from the bone here. You haven't got a good enough hold in the proximal segment, and the failure rate is less. That's called the TAD or the tip apex distance. Here, we're only seeing the AP x ray, it's measured on AP and lateral together. If you have an A3 fracture or reverse obliquity fracture, then the alignment of the fracture facilitates far too much slide. The DHS or the sliding hip screw will slide too much. So you have to put something in there that will create a lateral buttress that stops the thing sliding. That's what nails are for. A nail like this sits inside the canal and acts as a block to stop this sliding laterally. So it recreates a lateral buttress. The alternative is to use a blade plate, which comes up higher, and the strength of the blade plate supports lateral buttress. You can also, if you want to get a sliding hip screw, you can also support the lateral buttress with trochanteric stabilization plates, based on the DHS from Synthesis. It needs more inventory, more time, more kit, more complicated. And I'm never convinced that this is strong enough to hold everything, but it does help. So the lateral trochanteric stabilization plate goes over the top of the DHS, is held on by the screws down here, and you put individual screws or other implants into these fragments here, and it uses the amount of slide or collapse. So it's more inventory, more time, and more complexity. It is pretty well established that for reverse obliquities, half of the sliding hip screws will fail. Failure does not reduce value, it will fail as well. So a blade plate or a nail are better because they protect against the excess slide. 
And here we have extra capsular fractures, starting hip screw, or in the other. Now, for a lot of times these days, we do a lot of stuff more, more in males in the US for certain reasons. And a lot of that's surgical preference. But as I've mentioned, there are specific mechanics you have to understand to understand why you use individual devices. Our devices are designed to counteract the mechanics that are caused by the fracture. There's a lot being written by nails or plates. There's a big trend towards IM devices. A lot big, sorry, big trend towards in, into um, Missouri devices to provide that buttress effect. But they are more costly. There's probably more fractures caused by them if you have a short nail. And if you haven't got the complexity of the facilities to put them in, it's a problem. This is a um, subtract into the fracture treated by a nail, as you see, going around the canal. This is some trotting for a to buy an angled blade plate, a 95 degree angled blade plate, which controls the proximal segment very well. What about late presentation and failures? Um, as you'll see from both of these cases, in different ways, they're both formed into various. This case is a case I'm about to do in a week or two's time. It's a patient who had a sign nail placed. Um, outside the US, they had other implants placed at the same time. Both the sign nail and the other implants are broken because it's a non union tool here. Right? So it's back to the virus, it needs correction, and you can't walk on it. This is a failed sliding hip screw with a bit of a low fracture. You will see that the, the game is falling the virus. This time the failure is to the screws down here, it's tipped off and going to the virus. You will see how this comes off the side. When you try and provide a cantilever support for this, you must use loads of screws down here. This should be a lot longer. Sorry, this should be a lot longer. And the longer it is, the more support you've got the side of the femur, the less likely the lateral side of the cantilever is to come off. So it's really important that you use a long device. Do not use two holes in the chest of the top of the fractures. So I appreciate you all know this, it makes it very difficult, but it's much easier to do these surgeries early. I expect to do it in 24 hours, and I appreciate it's difficult to do that in many environments. The earlier you do them, the less deformity and shortening there is, less development of talus, less to take down, smaller operation, but that means on resources and facilities and equipment. If you delay shortening, scar, talus, and stiff soft tissues are a major problem. Do them early. It's the same issue for every fracture. However, if the delay is the same issue as failure, there are biological and mechanical issues because of the shape of the femur and the collapse and, the, and, and mechanical things predominate. It's consistently short and consistently inverse as both the two possible patients showed in the previous patient. You have to deal with the anatomy and get them together and deal with the mechanics. I'd like to spend a little bit of time talking about bone healing to illustrate why they don't heal. So a little while ago, I was involved with a group that wrote a paper which we described a bone healing organ. It's called the BHN theory in the British Journal in 2000, about two or three years And so hematomas form after fracture. It gradually changes the callus over time and gradually models. The tissue around the center of this is called the bone healing organ. And all we do during all our surgeries is manipulate it to allow it to heal appropriately. Non-operative treatment will facilitate of healing, assuming it's held still enough to let it heal. The bone healing organ is specifically responsive and behaves appropriately if the right amount of strain is applied to the fracture. If you think of bone formation and bone resorption and strain on a graph like this, and consider what happens as these change, then we know bone only forms when the strain is less than 2%. Up to 10% of the form cartilage, and above this, you form fibrous tissue and granulosa tissue. The bone healing strain range is down here. If you look at that area in detail, it, 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 and then if you've got very low strain, bone is resolved. 
the thick line represents the normal personal forming stasis that I hope we're all sitting at the moment with the same amount of bone formation and bone um, resorption in balance. This is after you fracture and form bone with an increased amount of strain to normal. If you have far too much strain, you absorb bone again. This is bone homeostasis. This is bone resorption. The fancy picture, if you ask no in space, where there was bone terribly, as you probably know, but also somebody lying dead all the time. This is um, the process of healing. And over this straight area, you're dealing with absolute stability or relative stability. And essentially, absolute stability is down here, and relative stability is all this area here. I think it's very rare we get this sort of healing. This picture particularly shows the plate on the tibia. You will see there's, there's no callus here next to the plate, where it's been fixed with absolute stability down here. There's a little bit of callus over here, and a lot of callus on the fibula. Which has got more relative stability. This just shows the spectrum of bone response to strain. All fracture healing is is progressive development of strain strain responsive tissues that allow things to go from coagulation tissue to fibrous tissue to cartilage to bone, and eventually goes to bone in the model. The fracture moves a lot, it organizes and gets stiffer. As it gets stiffer, that allows the next sort of tissue to heal, and the next tissue allows the next tissue, and so on, until you get bone and you get the modern. All we do is put implants in with all the other techniques to hold position and reduce the strain. Now, normally, non unions in failure are considered either hypertrophic or atrophic. I would suggest that atrophic injury is extremely rare. It's far more associated, it's far more common that most atrophic injuries are actually very well vascularized and the mechanical issues are massively dominant. So you think of this same graph as the bone healing organ. What happens in non-union is that if the, the bone healing tissue is trying to get down into the zone where it will fall bone. It may do it form a lot of bone, but for some reason it doesn't make it to stay in there all the time. So you have a fracture, it tries to heal, forms a lot of bone down, but at some area within that fracture, the strain remains too high, there needs to be only one plane. Because everywhere else heals, one plane fails because the strain in that zone is too high. The strain everywhere else is low enough. That's why there's bone formation. And this is interesting, the common unit fracture relatively thin nail, it's got none you need for one plane at the top. It always picks out an oblique plane and it always picks out one plane because all the other pieces heal because they've got low strain to their adjacent fragments. So that's the failure. And that's what, what, so what we have to do is correct the mechanics which facilitates the biology. In the femoral neck, and that means correcting the So Let's go back to our late presentation of proximal theory. Clearly, biological mechanical issues. If it's, if, if it's biological, we're talking about ADN in the involving the hip. But if it's mechanical, which all the trop ones are, it means it's consistently short, it's consistently in varus, the varus pulls the fracture apart every time there's pressure on it, and you've got to neutralize those forces. These are typical problems with not the failure of proximal femoral fractures. This is a intracapsular fracture that's gone to the end. Complete collapse of the head. There's no rescue for that other than a hip replacement. Indication, of course, being clean. This is a failed sliding hip screw. non union screw here. Probably the wrong devices we know for this implant. It's cut to the top of the head. If you get to it early enough, and this screw has not caused a big hole in the socket, you can rescue this with an osteotomy and reconstruction and maintaining the head. If the head's gone, you have to do another hip replacement. And here we have failure of the device for a reverse obliquity, hasn't held properly. Uh, it's a failure of the device has not doing properly. And uh, um, it's got another new thing here. This is a, a, a DCS. So a dynamic conduit screw, like dynamic hip screw. It's designed at a right angle. 
very few people use this anymore because this, this application is very hard to get to work very well. Again, here, the offset's too much. If this had been brought further over and the offset was used, this may well have healed, but it's been left too far um, it medialized here, which has been lateralized. And the excess strain that it creates on the implant, non union through here, develops, and the implant gives the very typical after the virus and so Several examples of the same sort of thing. The management of all these depends on your personal experience and resources available. This is a complex postural femoral fracture, treated by a nail, look pretty good. Well, I worry a lot for using these screws, these wires rather. It went on to fail. There's a non union through here. The result of non union is failure of the nail. Failure of the nail. For me, that would have been an angled blade plate on the outside, trying to press the forces because the head looks good. For this particular surgeon who came up with joint replacement, the joint replacement bypasses the whole thing. What you do depends on your personal experience and the resources you have available. This is a patient of mine who had an intracapsular non union. Same sort of problem. And this is a Powell 3 vertical intracapsular femoral neck fracture in a young man with good screw fixation and it's failed to heal. The head is still alive. There's a CT scan showing a vertical, high shear, high strain fracture line, single plane non union in the joint. The treatment is to put a valgus osteotomy actually, put an offset 120 degree blade plate and tip it over into valgus. That changes the shear forces here and the compression forces and it goes on the here. Femoral head in the environment. This is the diagram of the same operation. You cut a wedge of the lateral femur that corrects this shortening and varus. This is where the implant fits. Is that implant, that angle, that triangle there, represents this triangle here. As that comes down onto here, it corrects this and brings the head over the top. And the second screw is equal to the support. Measure that was a bit further in there. This is the patient I showed you before that I hope for next week. Um, he has a broken sign nail, got to come out. It was a gunshot wound, you can see this the bullet down there. This plate's got to come out. That will lead to this oblique non union here. You know, laterally based wedge, blade plate on the side, and correction. There's the wedge I'm going to cut. That's where the blade plate's going to fit. I'm hoping that will lead to correction. And that comes down to here, that triangle, which we've already seen in that triangle, and get correction. It should end up looking like that. I haven't done that one yet, so I haven't got the example. When you put it in, the articulated compression device goes on the side and you pull really, really hard on the outside. That brings this further over the top. It's compression over here and hopefully you get biology to heal before it comes in. Occasionally, you have to do a lot more. This is a patient that I did some time ago. I had a particularly bad immune through here, same sort of thing, all surface wire. There's a throat pulled off, knee bone defect, broken. Nail, then they're broken to the nail comes out. Because I was concerned about the quality of the needle buttress, I used an additional needle support, authorized by Jeff Mask, and a, a curved, narrow LCD CP plate was pushed through here inside the bone. Blade plate on the outside with correction screws for everything. That creates much more support than the needle here. And basically, I'm correcting the mechanics. Dealing with mechanical defects by an advanced technique here really will not is an off the scale of complexity. But but you get control of the thermal neck, the angle is brought down, pressure on the outside, compression in here, stopping the local strain down in the strain area where the bone healing organs work, additional means of cord support for security, and it goes on here. So in summary, um, I think first. Do no, do, no, do no harm and know your local culture. I appreciate some of the things I've shown you are, are what can be done and they may not be available where you are. You have to work things out in your own environment. Know your culture, know your patient, know your hospital, know what kit you've got, and know yourself and be honest. None of them may be appropriate care. I hope that was helpful. Um,
I will try to answer questions that are available in the lectures given. If not, my email is there, and I'm very happy to answer questions as you need. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.